Well, hello, um, everybody. I'm, I'm waiting for everybody to, to come into the, this virtual room. But I would like to welcome you all to this uh, policy dialogue that we will be having today around the Media Freedom Act. Uh, we will start in, in a minute. So um, um, I'm just waiting for, for the room to, to fill up. Okay, so um, I very welcome everybody to, to this like policy dialogue that we're hosting today at the European Policy Center. Uh, this event is co-organized with the Connecting Europe program, which connects civil society organizations and EU decision makers. And it's a joint initiative of the APC with the Stitfund Mercato. So uh, we're having like, two organizers here today. Uh, we will be discussing this very timely topic of the Media Freedom Act, which is like the last proposal of, of the commission. Uh, it was uh, recently unveiled last Friday only, and it's Monday. So this is, uh, I think, a very timely uh, time for to, to have this discussion. And I am surrounded today by a wonderful like, team of, of panelists here. And I would like to, um, first of all, um, ask you, uh, um, to introduce your, yourselves uh, uh, to like the different panelists that we're having here today and to um, tell me or like tell the, the audience like why do you think the, the Media Freedom Act is a, it's a relevant uh, uh, regulation and, and why do you think that that is that we should have uh, the Media Freedom Act? So others maybe if you want to start. Yes, with pleasure. Uh, good afternoon to all. So uh, briefly to present uh, the Media Freedom Act, it, uh, it consists actually of uh, two documents. So one is a proposal for a regulation, so proposal for binding rules for, Euro for, Euro for the internal media market. And then at the same time, the Commission adopted uh, another document, which is a recommendation. And uh, that recommendation is already in place and uh, media market players like media service providers and member states uh, uh, are encouraged already to have a look at that recommendation and start uh, implementing uh, implementing the, uh, the, the measures listed there. Ah, okay, so indeed, uh, apologies. Uh, I have not introduced myself. Um, uh, so my name is Odris Perkauskas uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm a deputy head of unit at the European Commission, DG Communication Network Content and Technology, the unit which is called Audiovisual Media Services uh, Policy. Uh, so with that, I will continue. So uh, I stopped uh, then, um, uh, I, I said that uh, the Media Freedom Act package consists of two documents, proposal of a regulation and uh, rec recommendation, which is already in place. and. Uh, the overall philosophy of the proposal was uh, to identify concrete uh, problems faced by media service providers and also European citizens, and uh, to try to come up with uh, very targeted and calibrated proposals. Uh, so what I mean by it um, is that uh, uh, we were trying for each uh, issue identified to come up with, uh, with an appropriate level of uh, regulatory intervention, not to overdo with regulatory intervention so that the me media market remains competitive and dynamic and media market players uh, do not face disproportionate bur burdens, but also not to undo, <laughs> not, to, uh, not, to, not to be too weak uh, with a proposal so that uh, the proposed uh, provisions can have a tangible impact and can change things uh, in the in the internal media market uh, for the better. Uh, looking uh, uh, at um, uh, all the different topics uh, uh, listed, uh, mm, uh, all the di different topics touched by Media Freedom Act, uh, perhaps I would concentrate on several of them, and then uh, then let's see if um, if participants uh, of this event are interested uh, in other areas too, because of course since uh, the proposal was uh, announced um, and advertised a bit uh, last Friday. There was some time already to hopefully to have a quick look um, at press materials, for example, or even at the legal texts uh, themselves. So some participants might, uh, might be aware already of the details of, uh, of the proposal. Uh, so uh, to, to, to give you a brief overview of um, 
of a proposed uh, regulation, uh, there is an important part on rights and duties of uh, media service providers and rights of recipients uh, of media services, which is uh, a lot about uh, protection of editorial independence. And uh, in particular, member states have to refrain from interfering in editorial independence. And uh, media market players uh, themselves, uh, they have to make available certain key information uh, about uh, about their identity and uh, uh, about uh, transfer about uh, about uh, conflict of interest which might undermine uh, independent reporting uh, and then and importantly also uh, journalists receive additional protections uh, and in particular uh, from uh, surveillance and from deployment of spyware uh so deployment of spyware is uh, restricted uh, i would say drastically it will be possible for member states to use it only in really uh, the most uh, exceptional cases and uh, surveillance remains uh, let's say less a little bit less regulated by media freedom act but still uh, will be subject to important safeguards in particular those coming from uh, humans or human rights instruments and the EU charter of uh, fundamental rights. Uh, then there is uh, quite an important big block on um, uh, on regulatory cooperation. It's a little bit more relevant I would say for the audiovisual sector so I will perhaps not uh, concentrate uh, on it too much but I will just say that uh, the uh, Media Freedom Act envisages the board uh, for media services uh, many of you will probably know that uh, now we have a European Regulators Group for Audiovisual Media Services, so regulate a group of regulators in audiovisual markets. And uh, the board for media services uh, will replace this existing structure and will, let's say, will have more tasks uh, and uh, will also have more support uh, for, from the European Commission in terms of resources so that it can um, uh, perform its uh, its uh, tasks uh, tasks uh, effectively. Uh, another important matter on which I would like to stop for a couple of minutes is uh, me distribution of media content in the online space. Uh, so of course you are all aware of uh, the Digital Services Act uh, and uh, platform so-called platform to business um, regulation. Uh, so Media Freedom Act takes another step in um, putting in place uh, guarantees for media service providers uh, so that uh, uh, so that platforms and in particular very large online platforms uh, do not uh, suspend uh, uh, their services to media service providers, uh, let's say unfairly. And uh, how uh, and what exactly will be put in place uh, by Media Freedom Act is, uh, first of all, the duty uh, for uh, very large online platforms to do their utmost to explain the reasons for uh, suspension of the service to media service providers in advance. So before uh, the, 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 the decision is uh, the decision to suspend the service is implemented. And then in addition, uh, complaints from uh, media service providers uh, uh, regarding such restrictions by very large online platforms uh, has to be uh, considered by platforms with priority. And uh, the third element is if uh, the problem from the perspective of a media service provider becomes systemic, so it uh, faces these, um, let's say, unjustified in the eyes of media service provider suspensions or restrictions uh, frequently. Uh, then uh, the media service provider can call on the very large online platform to engage in dialogue to eliminate the problem so that they do not reoccur re uh, in the future. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, these are the main points uh, about the uh, distribution of media content by, by very large online platforms. Uh, then another important building block is about uh, media market regulation and uh, you will find uh, two key articles uh, in that part. Uh, one is about different uh, 
um, market regulation measures by national authorities of different nature, be it laws or administrative decisions, and where the EMFA puts in place um, general principles to be observed by member states and their authorities, so this is, which is objective, objective justification, proportionality, and non discrimination, but also possibility for the board, for the new board for media services, upon request of the commission to come up with its opinion assessing these national measures where there is a likely impact on the internal market. So you could say that, you know, to simplify things a bit, if um, a decision affects uh, a media market player or a regulatory measure affects a media market player, which has uh, an impact uh, in the member state concerned on the formation of public opinion, then the board uh, will be able to come up and, for example, let's imagine the, the measure is problematic, say that indeed the measure is disproportionate in that particular country. And of course, it's an opinion, so uh, by, by nature, it's not binding, but still it's both uh, authoritative because it will be from the collective body of uh, media regulators across Europe. And on top of that, um, it is an element to be considered, for example, for the commission that it might assess indeed whether, whether the national measure is or is not justified, is or is not proportionate. So this, this is one, one article. And another article is on uh, media market concentrations. Uh, I, I will no, not go into details right now, but if, if uh, any participant uh, wants to hear more about uh, media market concentrations, I, I will gladly do so. It's again based on, on a combination of uh, setting out some key elements of uh, concentration review procedures say in advance and possibility for the board again for the board to come up uh, with opinions uh, and then the last block which i'd like to highlight is uh, allocation of uh, state advertising and audience measurement systems so these are two separate matters so allocation of advertising expenditure by state authorities uh, again they will be subject to the principles of objective justification proportionality and non-discrimination and accompanied by transparency measures. So public authorities and also state enterprises will have to publish each year uh, overviews of their uh, annual uh, media advertising expenditure together with uh, lists of benefiting entities and amounts allocated to each of those entities. So we, we think that it's an important transparency measure which is likely uh, to to prevent to some extent uh, the the examples we saw in the, in some markets uh, where authorities tended to direct significant amounts of of money to certain media outlets at at the expense let's say of more critical media outlets and audience measurement it's again a quite a specialized area but uh, the direction of travel is that um, uh, some aud some audience measurement systems they are not necessarily very transparent or inclusive. So there are players in the audience measurement uh, sub-market of media market uh, that tend to create their own proprietary uh, audience measurement systems and they do not uh, necessarily explain how uh, audience measurement works and what methodology uh, they are using and uh, they do not necessarily include the uh, uh, interested market players in elaboration of uh, those audience met measurement methodologies. So where the idea is to make this area much more open, transparent and inclusive so that there are much less questions and hesitations about uh, the figures which come out from those audience measurement systems. And of course, why it is important, it sounds technical, but it's important because uh, audience measurement uh, is used to calculate advertising prices. It is used also uh, to understand better how media content uh, is successful or not uh, with uh, audiences. Uh, so it's uh, important also for, for the production side of uh, media markets. Um, this is why uh, we thought it's, um, it's worth also uh, finding place for provisions on audience measurement uh, in the Media Freedom Act. And then just uh, two words on the recommendation. So it has two uh, parts. Uh, one part is about editorial independence and um, 
the Media Freedom Act itself, it has a provision uh, uh, obliging media service providers to take uh, appropriate measures to safeguard independence of editorial decisions. So it's it's a provision which is binding, but which leaves a lot of leeway to media service providers uh, to adjust um, uh, in editorial independence safeguards to the nature of their company and uh, the service uh, they provide. And besides, micro enterprises are not obliged to implement such such his safeguards. And then the directive, the, sorry, the recommendation, it helps uh, uh, media service providers by listing good practices. Uh, so what, uh, so different good practices which could be uh, deployed to safeguard editorial independence. And the second part uh, is equally split between uh, between the regulation, the proposed regulation and the recommendation. It's media ownership transparency. There are some key provisions in the Media Freedom Act, and the recommendation goes a bit a bit further and uh, suggests that on a on a voluntary basis, media companies disclose some further information like uh, interests of their owners and other media or non-media businesses, and invites member states also to help to improve transparency of uh, media markets, for example, by creating uh, uh, publicly available uh, online databases of uh, uh, media companies and uh, their owners. Uh, so that was my brief introduction to, to Media Freedom Act. Thank you. Thank you, Aldris. Uh, Chelke, maybe you want to come next? Sure, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you can hear me well. Um, this is Jake Chaki. I'm a uh, policy leader fellow at EUI. Uh, and in my previous life, I was research director um, for Europe Media and Democracy at Freedom House, um, which is a democracy NGO. Um, so I think um, when it comes to the, the main issues that the uh, Media Freedom Act tackles, I think its importance really lies in the fact that it tackles the issues that have come up in the member states over the past several years. And in that, uh, it is a, a fairly ambitious undertaking. Um, so I'm happy to go into those issues unless, Andrea, you would like to do the introductions first. Maybe uh, I'd like to go with everybody's introductions and then I will come back to you if you don't mind. So, so maybe you can guide us and give us a little bit of, of background as, as you just mentioned based on your research. So perhaps Pat left. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon uh, from the UK. Uh, my name is Václav Stetka. I am senior lecturer in communication and media studies at Loughborough University. And uh, I've been working for the last three years on a, on a research project uh, called the Illiberal Turn, uh, examining news consumption and uh, polarization and populism in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. So uh, from that perspective, uh, uh, I'm very much uh, interested in this uh, new act. I uh, see it as, a, as a, likewise as a very ambitious undertaking. And uh, I would say as a very welcomed attempt by the European Commission to, to finally tackle the issue of, of declining media freedom in Europe and in Central and Eastern Europe in particular, and, and to protect independent journalism, which, uh, which as we know is under attack in an increasing number of countries so perhaps that's that's all for the start and then we can go into details thank you and our last panelist hi um i'm molly colleen i'm a journalist at your active um, reporting on tech and media and um yeah it's been quite a busy year to be a media reporter there have been lots of different in initiatives that have come out and um this media freedom act is significant, I think, in the, the way that it's uh, much broader and kind of draws all those slightly more specialised um, strands together and to take a much more comprehensive kind of sectoral look at the issues um, and also is very relevant to a lot of uh, a lot of things that have been, have been being talked about for a number of years in terms of rule of law and media freedom in individual member states, but it's also very relevant to um, things that have been developing within the past few months alone, so uh, disinformation in terms of war in Ukraine, but also things like the spyware scandal, which is still unfolding. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much to every, every one of you. And thank you others for that overview of the Media Freedom Act, because I think it really, it, it is really helpful to, to set the debate now. Um, out of your four very short interventions, I think that the two words that I heard the most is ambitious and relevant. So I would like to, to ask you, Chelke, why, why do you think uh, that it's so ambitious and relevant? Like, why are we speaking of, of these, of the Media Freedom Act uh, under these two objectives? Perhaps uh, based on your research, you've done lots of research on CEE countries. So maybe you could like help us in the audience understand why did we got here and why are we speaking of this like piece of legislation right now vis-a-vis -vis what has been happening politically speaking in, in CEE countries in the last few years. Sure. So, um, so I think um, this is an act that is very relevant and ambitious also because it shows that there has been some learning on the part of the Commission uh, based on some of the tools that some member states have been using to capture the media. Um, and here I'm primarily referring to Hungary and to Poland. And, uh, and throughout, throughout today's session, I will be bringing you examples mostly from those countries, uh, especially from Hungary, because um, I think that that is where we are seeing the biggest problems and the most complex situation. Um, and that is what represents uh, what can go wrong in other member states. Um, so in that, I, I really share the Commission's focus on, on the problems, um, because I know that um, there have been some concerns by some stakeholders as well as some member states uh, about enacting new regulation, that it could wreck already uh, working models uh, and an already functioning domestic system in some countries, uh, but I hope that those are overstated, those worries. Um, so when it comes to the problems, actually, uh, Adrius has already given us a, um, a good rundown uh, of, of the Media Freedom Act, but let me just highlight um, three uh, issues uh, that the Act tackles and give you some examples of the problems that we have seen in, members, in the member states. Um, so one, the, the Media Freedom Act uh, essentially brings us two things. One, protections of the, for the media sphere, and then two, um, requirements for certain media outlets or governments. And so when it comes to protections, um, it does bring us protections for the independence uh, and, and the funding of public service media. And that is something um, that most uh, recently has been an issue in Slovenia. I'm sure many of you know um, the funding of the Slovenian news agency uh, was, was a topic for uh, several months, uh, as well as interference with the editorial independence of the um, Slovenian state media is still an issue uh, because of appointments by the previous government. Um, we have also seen in, in Poland and Hungary uh, the public broadcaster, uh, the public media being essentially taken over by the government and essentially being turned into a propaganda channel for government messages. Um, so this issue of protection for public service media is, is a very important part of the act. Um, another important part that I would like to highlight is, is the requirement related to uh, the fair allocation of state advertising. Um, and that is because state advertising has been used in uh, some member states uh, to give an unfair advantage um, to, out, to friendly outlets to the government. Uh, I mean, this has been the case uh, in Hungary, um, to some extent in Poland as well. Uh, outside here, this has been the case in Serbia. Um, so this is certainly something that can, uh, it's a practice that can spill over to other member states. So it's important that the act tackles this or tries to tackle this issue. Um, one thing I would note here, um, which is interesting is that the act says that uh, this, um, the state advertising uh, provision is limited to communities over 1 million people. Um, so this means that uh, in most cases, local governments can still allocate state funding uh, or, or state advertising resources. Um, so that, that is that may be a loophole that may need to be tackled. Um, and another question, but we can go into detail later, is what happens if uh, if a government says that this is not state advertising, it's just state funding. You don't even have to advertise in exchange. But those are some of the tricks. Um, we can go into detail later. Uh, and then one last thing that I would like to highlight is related um, to um, the requirements um, related to ownership transparency, uh, which as Adrias mentioned is both in the binding part, but also in the, uh, in the recommendations uh, part. 
And I think that uh, that ownership, in addition to uh, funding uh, and finding a, uh, a working business model for the media, is a crucial aspect of policy uh, that has to be addressed uh, because because really the two flow from each other. Um, so media markets often are no longer profitable uh, because of the changes that have taken place over the past two decades, and outlets often cannot finance their operations. Uh, and, and in that, they are very vulnerable to takeovers by governments, by oligarchs, or by anyone else, any other actor um, that has a political agenda. So in that, ownership is directly linked to democracy. And it's really the, the, the crux of the matter when it comes to a uh, free and, and really healthy public sphere. Um, so the media capture that took place in Hungary which uh, just to give you one example, uh, culminated in, in the establishment of Keshma, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's this large media conglomerate um, that unifies almost 500 uh, media titles. And this was established after businessmen allied with the government simply donated their outlets for free to this conglomerate. Um, so this is something that uh, could happen in other member states too. And we have already seen it sort of happening in Poland in a, on a much smaller scale, scale uh, where the um, state-owned uh, company PK in Orlen um, uh, has purchased much of the regional media. So this is one trend that I'm glad that, uh, that the act is at least trying to tackle. Also because, um, to, to, just to give you two more examples and then I will stop, also because um, there have been some uh, conflicts of conflicts of interest problems in the Czech Republic. Um, I'm sure Václav can talk more uh, to those, and problems with transparency in uh, in several other member states, uh, including in Slovenia and in France. Um, in fact, recently in uh, in France, we have seen some steps uh, on the French media market that are not that dissimilar to what happened in Hungary more than a decade ago. Uh, and what I mean by that uh, is is an increase in concentration and uh, takeovers and, and makeovers uh, by influential businessmen with links to politi politics or, or with an explicit political agenda. Um, so I guess I will stop there. This is just a uh, really brief overview, overview for, for you. Um, I will just say that, uh, that in general, I think the proliferation of new tools uh, is not always a good thing. Uh, I think it's better if uh, you're using tools that you already have, but in this case, the commission lacked tools to address these challenges. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that, that the act came out and then we can start this uh, long discussion. Well, I think that you opened up lots of very interesting topics that I, I would like to, to, to use and to disseminate um, all over our conversation. I, I really liked one of the things that you mentioned, which is like this question that you were asking yourself, like, what if states just say it's just state funding and not a state advertisement. I think that is like really good food for, for thought and, and as well as, as the issue that we will like probably dive a little bit more into, which is that ownership is linked to democracy directly. But in, in that sense, you mentioned um, like basing your research, how this was happening in the CE countries, you brought about like some some countries, you also mentioned Serbia, and I wanted to, to probably go to WhatsApp. I know you offered um, 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 a report on one of the our research programs that you were like carrying about, like precisely speaking about this, about the deterioration of media freedom in CE countries. So I wanted to ask you if you could probably give us an overview or or, or some examples about like how the situation is, is unfolding and how um, did we also like uh, ended up ended up here and how do you think under your perspective and based on your research that the Media Freedom Act could could help or not? Um, so like I mentioned before, that like sometimes it is not useful to create new instruments, and she ended her speak like saying that this is a good time because like the commission lacks the instruments so uh, do you like agree with her or would you like to to add like something something else in that sense yeah absolutely uh i, I very much agree with uh, uh the assessment uh, provided by sherike and uh, her overview of the uh, troubled uh, situation of media in, in uh, central and eastern europe uh, not just in in hungary and poland those are the two countries uh, which uh, are uh, un, un, under the most detailed uh, spotlight, but, but there are other problems in, in other countries, uh, obviously Slovenia, Bulgaria, but uh, including uh, uh, Czech Republic, where I, where I come from uh, myself. 
so uh, you asked about our research and, and the implications of that research or the connection between that and, and, and the uh, proposed and the, and the act. And I have to say, uh, based on what we have uh, observed in uh, four countries uh, of the region, our research concerned Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic and Serbia, uh, we are very much uh, pleasantly surprised by the boldness of uh, the Commission's approach and, and by those various instruments that uh, promise to uh, improve the situation of media freedom and independence uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, Europe um, in general, uh, because some of those uh, instruments are very much aligned with what we have been uh, arguing for based on uh, the, the data coming from, from our countries. I would mention, uh, perhaps uh, to, to begin with, I would mention the issue of independence of public service broadcasting, which, which really uh, strikes uh, as one of the most important uh, uh, issue and, and uh, one of the most important goals uh, by the, that, that, that is proposed by the, by the Act. Um, from our data, we know that in countries where public service media is still relatively independent, and that, that's the case of Czech Republic, uh, it, it acts as a sort of an anchor, a center of uh, a media field uh, that uh, promotes certain values that other media and journalists uh, then uh, look up to. And uh, those values obviously are the values of the impartiality, uh, in the political independence, uh, quality uh, news provisions. Um, and uh, in, in such countries where we see public service media still fulfilling this, this kind of mission, we also see uh, a relatively uh, smaller or not as uh, prominent uh, process of polarization of the media and political scene. In other words, wherever we see public service media being captured by, by the government um, and turned into uh, an instrument of propaganda, uh, we, we see it quickly taking uh, one side of, of, the, of the divide, of the political divide, and uh, uh, there is simply no equivalent media service provider in the center anymore. So that's that's a very dangerous process that spirals out of control, and then we have these two camps uh, basically not uh, uh, talking to each other anymore. So that's what just one uh, example of why it's so essential for democracy to pr protect uh, independent uh, public service media. But there are other uh, very good and uh, ambitious uh, proposals in the uh, in the draft or in the, in the act. Um, I'm personally very much uh, keen to see. Um, uh, the implementation of the Article 6 on editorial uh, independence. I think that's one of the sort of thorniest issues, and we have seen it already by the reactions from the reactions of various stakeholders. It's, some are afraid that uh, with this article, the Commission is going too far. But I myself, uh, I, I believe that uh, this is really the only way that uh, can provide or, or, or safeguard some kind of change. Uh, and uh, protect uh, pr the protection of, of media uh, independence, freedom of, uh, of independence of editorial freedom is, is really, uh, again, one, one of the crucial aspects of uh, safeguarding healthy and pluralistic media environment in general. So maybe we'll go into the, into the details of this particular act later in the conversation, but I just wanted to flag up that uh, from our research, uh, these are only things that we can we can uh, endorse. Well, thank you very much, Václav. Um, I think that I'm going to, to ask uh, Molly next because you mentioned Article 6. And it's true that some stakeholders and organizations have been like pushing in favor of it and some others um, have like pushed against it, like for it to be to be removed. And I'm very like interested in, in knowing uh, Molly, your your um, your opinion in this, because I, there's like something in the article that I find really interesting. And it's that it says that that media service providers should take measures that they deem appropriate. This is like a direct, uh, like direct quote. So, do you think this is this is enough to guarantee like uh, media transparency, and media freedom? Like, what do you think? Editorial independence, basically, more than media freedom. I mean, just like go into the details of the of, of the act now. Um. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's definitely a part of the act that has divided opinion quite significantly. Um, and I think it was interesting to see 
in the presentation of the act on Friday that uh, Vera Yorova, the commissioner, one of the two commissioners um, presenting it was made repeated reference to the fact that the commission isn't trying to um, regulate media specifically, but trying to regulate the media space and that the commission isn't um, isn't trying to kind of disrupt the functioning of media organizations internally and specifically. Um, and I think that seemed like quite a response to some of the criticism that's already been mentioned of Article 6 um, and also some of the criticism that's come from certain stakeholders of the regulation in uh, as a whole and a questioning of whether the whether this is some whether media is something that should be regulated at the EU level. Um, so in terms of the almost vagueness of the actual content of Article 6 in terms of what it actually um, means by the steps that should be taken to guarantee editorial independence, I think it's almost, it seems like potentially partly a response to or maybe an anticipation of um, some of the, the pushback or the criticism of the fact that media policy is being regulated at an EU level. Um, yeah, so I mean, in terms of the effectiveness, it's it's quite hard to say, given that it's there isn't really anything too concrete laid down in terms of what should actually be undertaken by organisations individually. Um, and I, I think it leaves a lot up potentially to individual um, outlets and individual oh, individual um, organizations to to kind of see what will what will result oh thank you molly maybe others i think this is the perfect time for you to to come in with and speak a little bit about this uh, small piece of controversy what is um what do you think like from your role at the commission that that um that should be like why is the why, why is article six as, as it is and what do you think about uh, the uh, why is the idea of self-regulation like so present in this in this media freedom act uh, yes thank you so indeed uh, with uh, we we spent uh, probably most of of not most of the time but really more time on Article 6 and on many other articles, especially articles dealing with uh, administrative cooperation with media regulators, because we realized that uh, with this article, we are uh, touching a very sensitive area of uh, media uh, markets and, uh, and a very sensitive field of, uh, of activities of uh, media organizations. So we wanted to, to be absolutely sure that we are not, not doing more then is necessary to establish some safeguards uh, for uh, the protection of uh, individual editorial decisions alongside with um, some media transparency measures. So this is why indeed, um, as, um, as you pointed out uh, correctly, uh, for example, when it comes to editorial independence safeguards, the particular phrase uh, used is, uh, that uh, media service providers shall take measures that they deem appropriate with a view to guaranteeing the independence of individual editorial decisions. On top of that, uh, this uh, obligation, which leaves wide margin of discretion to media service providers themselves, is addressed to media service providers providing news and current uh, affairs content. So this is already this already narrows down the the range of uh, media service uh, media outlets uh, affected and on top of that there is the final part of this article 6 uh, which explains that uh, uh, the obligations under this article shall not apply to media service providers that are micro enterprises so um, this is a strong uh, better regulation element um, Mm, uh, to to make sure that you know if uh, if you are just a media startup or a very small uh, niche uh, media outlet, uh, uh, you are in a way discharged of this regulatory burden, which in itself is I would say uh, rather soft. Uh, and perhaps uh, just to mention, we have a 
two points um, of this Article 6, which are perhaps uh, slightly less uh, discussed uh, in Part 1 of, of that article. Uh, according to Part 1 of article, media service providers uh, would uh, make uh, easily accessible to the recipients of their services some key information like name, names of owners, uh, and then names of uh, beneficial owners in, in the sense of uh, beneficial ownership of anti-money laundering directive and its beneficial ownership uh, definition. And then uh, there is a point, point B in the second part asking uh, uh, media service providers to enter a disclosure of any actual uh, potential conflict or potential conflict of interest. But here again, uh, this uh, a key phrase of uh, shall take measures that we deem appropriate uh, still applies to the disclosure of actual or potential conflict of interest uh, too. So there is a, a lot of uh, leeway, I would say, for media services uh, how to do that. So this is the background to this article. And as, as I already said at the beginning, uh, the whole construction of having um, a regulation propose, proposal for a regulation and then recommendation is to make sure that uh, uh, that uh, we don't really uh, prescribe um, in detail what media service providers are expected to do, that we don't over-regulate, don't overreach, and uh, more detailed ideas are in the recommendation and can serve as a source of inspiration for media service providers which want to strengthen their um, transparency and their editorial independence. Oh, thank you. I think this is this is perfect because we have one one question here. So perhaps before moving on to the next uh, block of questions, I would like to ask the panel. Um, this is to all of you. So uh, whoever wants to to take it on, we have a question from uh, Tom Weingarten who says that suppose the Media Freedom Act would enter into force as it is, would that mean that France, Poland, or all the countries would have to change their media system? Because I think this is uh, kind of related to what we have we have discussed now. If I can just quickly follow up on, oh, sorry. Just an obvious is a comment on uh, Article 6 uh, and, uh, and the, uh, the first part of Article 6, uh, which is about uh, ownership. Uh, and, and just follow up with some criticism on that because I know that that has also been um, an article that has been <laughs> criticized from the other side. Uh, so currently in the mandatory part, it simply requires uh, that the names and of direct and indirect owners uh, be made public uh, without any additional uh, rules and so that you know that means that if the owner is a shell company or if the owner is Mr X that I can't really see how that is relevant or or, or useful information uh, for the public um, and and of course the recommendations go further and in a good direction as you mentioned uh, because they suggest that uh, that member states could make publicly available when there are links between the activities of owners uh, and when they own other things. And, and actually, that would have helped a lot if that was in the mandatory part, because right now I, I can easily see this as a box ticking exercise for most countries where they would just say, well, here, this is public, um, that's it. Uh, at the same time, I know that the uh, media ownership monitor was mentioned as something that will be um, uh, developed and, and fun, co-funded by, by the Commission. Um, so hopefully, perhaps, um, that, can be, um, that can be a tool that has some of these additional details. Um, so in any way, I, I, I feel like the fact that currently, uh, when it comes to ownership, the mandatory part asks so little uh, of member states, uh, I, I think that is a missed opportunity. Uh, and just on the on the question that was asked, um, uh, whether member states will have to change their media systems, my understanding is, but this is, uh, I think, for you, Adrias, to answer. But my understanding is that that the that the Commission said that most member states live up to most of these uh, provisions that are included in the Act. Um, they just have to make sure not to breach. Um, certain other provisions. Uh, obviously, the the exception is uh, Hungary, Poland, and perhaps um, some of the the other countries. So it's more relevant uh, in those cases. Yes. Uh, so thank you, uh, actually, for helping me to answer the question because uh, indeed, uh, let's say 
uh, whether member states have to change their legal systems, which is something, we, this is something we are always carefully monitoring. So far, we don't see Mm, don't see a lot of that uh, coming because uh, because again uh, most of the provisions uh, of uh, regulation are not that detailed so and uh, in many member states uh, and even in member states which you would perhaps consider problematic from sometimes actually on paper we have quite good uh, media law so all in all, probably there will be not so many cases where member states will have uh, to do something to change uh, their laws or administrative practices. But okay, in some cases, perhaps on allocation of state advertising, uh, perhaps we will want to put in place some uh, criteria uh, on allocation of state advertising just to make sure that there is uh, more of objectivity and non-discrimination in the system. Um, but all in all, we don't see uh, a, a lot of that. And on um, on media ownership transparency, uh, perhaps I should give a brief explanation of the background in the, against which we were introducing um, uh, the provisions, both in the proposed regulation and in the recommendation. And that background is that there are also some other instruments like anti-money laundering um, uh, uh, legislation and uh, company legislation and uh, even initiatives on uh, interconnecting uh, business registers. So we are we were already preparing the Media Freedom Act, taking into account um, those frameworks and also the fact that they are being uh, themselves, those other frameworks themselves are being revised to try to bring up um, uh, uh, more information to the public and all those interested in the media ownership information. So, uh, so we were trying to balance many elements. So how Media Freedom Act interacts with those other instruments, uh, what is the appropriate level of burden on media service providers, on uh, on member states, and what would be useful. And on, on top of that, indeed, uh, there is a media ownership monitoring project um, which was proposed uh, by the European Parliament and the Commission uh, launched a call already some time ago and rather soon we will have uh, first results. Uh, of that project, uh, so that project precisely is um, is uh, expected uh, to to do what is still uh, missing a bit. So using all those uh, all, all the data available as a result of one framework or another, or directly from uh, media companies, uh, to present it clearly so that uh, so that you understand uh, uh, who are the main market players in a particular country and uh, who, who are owners uh, behind uh, such market players. So this is why, let's say, um, taking all those elements into account, we perhaps did not go ahead with some uh, detailed obligations on member states to put in place uh, uh, publicly available online uh, databases. Also because uh, after calculating the cost of it, we realized that, you know, you, you could think that the cost falls on the member state authorities, but ultimately member state authorities will transfer the cost to uh, media service providers because uh, media service providers would be asked uh, to supply such data, for example, on a regular basis. So, so it would result inevitably in some administrative burden on, on media service uh, uh, providers. Thank you. I would like to know if another person from our panel has uh, another remark and you want to, to come in. Otherwise, um, I would like to follow on the topic of ownership and transparency. So this is this is perfect then. <laughs> so then I'll, I'll continue with the with the issue of, of ownership because I think that one of the things that was that was mentioned and I think is like very rightful to to mention so is that. Um, you both uh, commented that uh, that normally this like this is building on existing instruments and that um, member states have their own like instruments to guarantee like media plurality and freedom. But you also mentioned that this might be a little bit more uh, disruptive for for uh, countries such as like Hungary and and Poland. So I want to to ask you because uh, one of the things that you also mentioned at the beginning that I think is really rightful to mention is that this is not only an issue affecting. Poland and, and Hungary, but this is something that has the capacity of the spread and, and that it is spread in, in, in this sense. So I would like to, to, to ask you, like in this sense, 
when we're having a, a very like a deteriorating political landscape in Europe with when this idea of, of the illiberal turn of these countries is like very really present how important it is to guarantee like media pluralism and transparency and, and to what extent ownership plays a big role in this because I think this is like one of the big big topics and I don't want it to be like a part of the previous conversation I think uh, it deserves like a uh, like a conversation on its own Andre, and what, what's question to me or everyone or it's uh, to, to everybody uh, because I think it's really broad and, and you all would like to I mean I'm sure that you can add something so it's not targeted to a particular person that's something that I really wanted to open so if, if you want to come on like Patla, I see you uh, and Mike yeah. so okay if, if I may start uh, so in my view uh, it, obviously it's, it's it's a very important uh, provision uh, and uh, again one to be welcomed the one that uh, uh, has a chance to improve uh, the state of uh, uh, transparency of, of media in, in Europe and again especially in Central and Eastern Europe where there, this has been a very thorny and uh, uh, palpable uh, issue for a long time but at the same time I, I think that as a matter of fact uh, it's not as important as the other part of the article 6 the, the, the provisions regarding uh, uh, editorial independence and it, in fact these two in my view go well together um, it, it is a fact that in most countries uh, people are more or less aware of who controls the media of course uh, there are all the kind of attempts to hide the real owners uh, by those who uh, want to basically use the media as an instrument to um, uh, enforce or, or, or promote their own particular political or, or business interests. But uh, nowadays, thanks to uh, also the work of many independent uh, journalists or uh, NGOs, uh, we are broadly aware of, of w which, which media belongs to whom. Um, but I think that it obviously is, is important to have this on paper or, or, or made official. But uh, if we only focused on transparency, it would still not uh, prevent from certain negative uh, um, trends to, to happen. For example, the capture of uh, certain media companies by political powers, or even, even by the government, as we have been seeing in, in, the, uh, in Hungary and in Poland. So I think that uh, uh, whilst we treat the provision for media trans ownership transparency as a sort of a baseline, uh there is something to to uh put above that and uh, uh connect it with and that's the uh, provision regarding uh, editorial independence so in other words uh this article will make it much more difficult for a uh, state company or government controlled or linked owners to uh to claim that the media they control are independent and at least uh, given that uh, you know providing that uh, there will be efficient implementation of, of, of uh, these provisions in, into the national legislation so um, I, I see these these two demands as, as interrelated again welcoming the um, attempt to make the ownership more transparent but in my view it only makes sense if it's accompanied by the demands to also, uh, ensure that uh, the editorial mechanisms are independent from, from those owners. Thank you, Václav. Uh, perhaps, Molly, you would like to follow up? Um, yeah, no, I I would agree um, with what's been said in terms of um, editorial independence versus ownership. I think, um, I mean, one of the arguments that's been made about the um, complexity of regulating in this area is that there are so many different media systems at work and that in some countries concentration or um, ownership has become more concentrated not necessarily just for reasons of declining media freedom but maybe for economic reasons and um, especially in terms of smaller outlets that might have suffered during the pandemic and um, so um, I think it's perhaps uh, more complicated than just saying 
concentration is is a sign of a necessarily worsening situation um in that sense greater transparency in terms of ownership while it's definitely um beneficial in lots of ways if that then um if if greater transparency of ownership is um seen as revealing concentration which is taken to be a a negative sign um where it might not actually be negative be as negative in practice um i think that makes it potentially the less useful compared to editorial independence um as has been in as has been said um i think the editorial independence provisions are potentially a bit more widely applicable um when it comes to measures for all different types of systems well, thank you. I think it connects because we have like two new um, questions from from our audience. Like this issue of editorial independence connects to one of the questions posed by Salman Dejeri. He he says that the contents of many ads financed by governments are politically motivated. For example, in Hungary, such as such ads like anti Soros, anti Jay Junker, anti refugees, migrants, or in other countries, anti EU ads, etc which are unacceptable to publish for many independent media outlets. How can or how should the proposed regulation deal with this issue with regard of a balanced distribution of public acts funds? I think this is a very this is a complicated question, but I think it's really relevant. And, and to some extent, we've touched on some of the issues already, like the issue of funding and the issue of, of media independence and transparency and freedom. It's um, whoever wants to take over. This is the, the floor is is yours. I mean, if others perhaps have solutions, but to me, it seems like this is one of those cases where governments can really trick the system. <laughs> because to me, if a government is uh, is pushing advertising that is unacceptable to certain media outlets, uh, then, then there isn't really a whole lot that you can do. And this kind of reminds me of the case of uh, that there is a lot of talk about disinformation and, and the impact of disinformation in, in member states. Um, but uh, but what can you do when uh, when that disinformation originates with the government? <laughs> and so um, to me, this question seems like the the way that um, this question points to to the way that uh, that authoritarian learning is working in these countries. Uh, that they are always trying to innovate and and trying to find new ways. But perhaps others have a solution to this. Do you have a solution or do you have a, a comment on this? Well, solution. So inevitably, Media Freedom Pact is, of course, act is, of course, uh, part of a solution. And um, again, it's up to debate um, whether we go uh, far enough or just uh, just what or whether we do just uh, what is needed. So so where, of course, we have uh, those uh, principles that criteria procedures must be objectively justified, non-proportionate, uh, proportionate, non-discriminatory. And then uh, accompanying transparency obligations that uh, expenditures uh, have to be disclosed by media outlet. Uh, uh, of course, you could say all of this um, does not prevent the type, uh, certain type of media messages appearing in the public discourse. Of course, uh, of course not. But at least uh, there is a, a chance that uh, that uh, the whole system is uh, rebalanced a bit or at least uh, it is put in the spotlight and then criticized with uh, with some data uh, available to support such criticism so in other words uh, there is a chance of uh, change that um, that uh, that uh, not only pro-government media is um, getting uh, those funds uh, but also other media which simply uh, satisfy the particular need uh, of uh, of the authority. So, for example, if uh, an authority wants to target a region, um, so of course you can question if the authority picks uh, only one, uh, for example, newspaper in the, in that region, and that newspaper appears to be pro-government. So, so let's say there will be more tools to question um, these practices uh, by member states to put them in, to, into spotlight and in the more serious cases even to act um, uh, against, um, against such practices. Thank you very much. I think that uh, 
uh, for this like, last part, we were like approaching the, the end of the panel. I would like to leave at least 15 minutes for Q&A with the audience. Um, I, want to, I want to mention that this uh, regulation comes at a time of heavy regulatory activity when it comes to the space. Recently, um, the Commission published the, the Code of, uh, of Practice on this information. And I would like to, to, to ask the panel if, if the Commission is going to the right direction, like going in um, first with the publication of the Code of Practice, now with the Media Freedom Act, uh, what, what do you think about this? Maybe Vatla or, or Molly, you can, you can express your thoughts on this question. I know you've been looking into it. Yeah, just uh, briefly I, to answer, I think that uh, indeed uh, we have been seeing uh, a much heightened uh, a period of activity uh, from, from Commission on the media front in the last several years. And uh, if you ask about whether the direction is right or wrong, well, I would say the direction is probably broadly right um, towards uh, a more hands-on approach, but at the same time, uh, obviously, uh, balancing out different, trying to balance out different interests, different needs, uh, different values also, which we have already mentioned here, that sort of a permanent uh, conflict between uh, safety or uh, protecting from certain risks and harms on the one hand side versus the, the, the need to, uh, to, to protect the freedom of expression on the other, uh, so uh, taking into account the, 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 this, this very sensitive uh, uh, line that the committee, that the, that the commission is, is forced to, to walk, I think that um, the direction is, is broadly right. Uh, but and, and this Media Freedom Act will, I think, be a, a, a litmus test of whether the, the countries, the, the individual member countries, agree with uh, with this uh, approach and uh, we'll see very soon uh, wh wh whether there will be such a such an agreement uh, but I would say that uh, it's high time uh, for the commission to indeed uh, change the so far predominantly market driven approach to media and communication which has um, characterized the media policies in in the EU for the last couple of decades perhaps. And finally, start treating media as something special, not just another uh, part of uh, market, but uh, something that actually this act itself uh, acknowledged as a public good. And that's something I've been very pleased to see in, in, in the text, uh, this phrase, the media service is a public good. I think it's a, it's a milestone in a symbolic kind of uh, confirmation of this changed approach. Uh, by the European uh, uh, authorities, and uh, yeah, uh, let, let, let's see uh, how it's uh, how it's uh, accepted. Well, thank you, Václav. I'm not sure if if, if another fellow panelist wants to to come in. I think you end up in a very like high note, which is uh, something that I think we really have to appreciate. But if 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 not, Molly, I would like to ask you because. Following the release of the of the Digital Services Act, which is another piece of regulation that perhaps we haven't brought uh, in today, but I think that to some extent both of them communicate, and as well like the anti-slap directive on the Media Freedom Act and, and others, right? As we have been discussing, I think the, the Commission have been a, have had a very proactive year this uh, this year. So I would like to to ask you, like, what are the further steps that the Commission should target? I think that um, in relation to, to fostering deeper media pluralism and transparency across the union, this might be a little bit of a difficult question, but but perhaps uh, you, you would like to, do you have some thoughts on this? Um, yeah, so, I mean, as you say, it's been a very active year, um, the DSA and the anti-slaps directive, um, but there's also been the recommendation on the safety of journalists that came out last year, um, and then, a little further back there was also copyright reform um so it's been quite a, a busy time um i think one thing that might become increasingly relevant in the near future which um is touched on by the media freedom act is the issue of spyware and surveillance and protection of journalist sources um and i mean there's an investigation ongoing at the moment in the parliament into that into the Pegasus scandal, but I think um, probably we'll see some further action on that. Um, 
I think given that there's been so much coverage in the past year alone of areas where there were quite long-standing calls for some sort of initiative on the EU level, uh, the attention right now just naturally shift also to looking at how well these will work in practice now that they're in place, um, especially in the case of things like the recommendation on the safety of journalists um, and the part of the SLAPS directive which covers domestic cases rather than cross-border cases because that is also a recommendation rather than a directive so um which means that neither of those are um binding um so i think even though they've been covered in practice there might still be gaps in terms of how well they how um how effective they are going to be um I think also there's been a lot of discussion in the past year as a background to all these initiatives about, um, which I mean, we've covered extensively today in terms of there being individual states where um, media freedom is declining more precipitously than in others um, or more markedly. Um, so I think the there might be more attention to the extent to which the commission is willing to put pressure on individual states given that they've given them such a high profile in the discussion surrounding these EU initiatives um, and yeah so I think kind of attention to how how this is all playing out at a at a state level will be particularly um, significant going forward especially because something like the copyright reform was brought in um, a few years ago now, and yet its transposition of it into national law is um, is quite significantly lagging. Um, and so I think it's quite a long process until we can really say that these things have been dealt with and let's, let's see what else there is to focus on. Well, thank you, Molly. I would like to ask the rest of the panelists if you have like any final thoughts before we proceed to the Q and A. They're already like piling up, uh, at least a couple of them. So just just to just to wrap up, maybe Audrey, you can take the floor next. Yes, with pleasure. So. Uh, just a couple of uh, finishing uh, words. Uh, so on on spyware, indeed, uh, we also see this as, a, as an important topic, and uh, and spyware. So Media Freedom Act, uh, we focused a lot on uh, on putting in place, um, let's say, five laws of <laughs> limiting conditions for the deployment of spyware. So I would say. Uh, once, uh, if let's say, if uh, the Media and Freedom Act uh, is um, adopted by the court legislators, by the council and our parliament as it is, um, it will be uh, it will be a, a strong and robust um, set of safeguards against the uh, deployment of uh, spyware. In particular, there is a condition saying that uh, you have to demonstrate as an authority that uh, less intrusive uh, techniques uh, to gather the information needed, for example, for criminal investigations uh, are not um, effective um, in, in a particular case. So, so that you need, you absolutely need this intrusive uh, uh, spyware uh, deployment. So I think this will help, help a lot. And uh, on indeed, uh, Molly, you were absolutely right that um, recently there was quite a lot of activity on the part of a commission, European Union, indeed, there is a there is a combination of directives which are yet to be transposed by all member states, and besides audiovisual media services directive as well, and then there are some recommendations like safety of journalists recommendation, and then we come up with uh, with a proposed regulation, and also yet another recommendation. So of course, this whole setting uh, and taking into account all the delays and, and transposition of directives. Um, uh, this was one of the reasons uh, why the Commission dared to go ahead with a proposal of uh, of a regulation in the sensitive field um, of, of media, precisely with uh, those problems around the long um, delays and transposition of the directives. Thank you. Well, thank you, Olivier. Uh, Zalki? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to. Uh... Um, really echo what uh, what Molly said uh, that implementation will be key 
uh, because uh, I, I agree that the Commission is going in the right direction. But the implementation will be up to the member states uh, in, in most cases, even if uh, we have this new board. Uh, and so, for example, in the case of um, the use of spyware against journalists, um, the Act calls for, for an independent investigation and, and the possibility of an appeal to an independent court. But what if the courts and institutions are no longer independent in, in some member states in question? Um, so I know I may sound like a broken record that I keep going back um, to a few cases, but, but it is true that, um, that one cannot uh, talk about media independence without judicial independence. Uh, and, uh, and so um, it was great to see that there was uh, a lot of focus on, uh, on judicial independence uh, earlier and, and the rule of law. Um, but we saw with the conditionality mechanism and uh, what happened uh, yesterday, and I know that there will be a separate discussion about that at EPC, but we saw there that, uh, that there have been some progress, but also there hasn't really been an implementation. Um, so all this is just to say that, uh, that the implementation will be the Achilles heel uh, of, of the act. Um, and, uh, and I think it would be uh, important to place more uh, more emphasis on, on judicial independence, because you can't have media independence without that. Well, thank you very much. And Václav, perhaps you want to, to close the panel now. Yeah, uh, as they say, the devil is in the detail. And uh, in this case, the devil is in the implementation, as, as colleagues have already pointed out. Uh, and to some extent, we will only be able to assess the success of this act uh, uh, in, in the four years, I believe that's the period of monitoring uh, envisaged uh, by the by the act. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll, we'll uh, see how well this will be implemented and transcribed into respective uh, laws and uh, and practices. But uh, regardless of, of that, I want to remain optimistic and I want to emphasize that uh, uh, I, I see this act as, as a very important signal uh, in its own right which which the committee uh, which the commission sends first of all towards the journalists uh, by making it clear that that uh, it hears their pleas uh, and and their calls for uh, more protection uh, protection of their independence and, and and freedom but also the signal towards the the, the governments of those countries uh, which have uh, a tendency to to mingle with uh, uh, or meddle with uh, uh, with the freedom of media, uh, including uh, the public service uh, media, uh, but also it's a signal towards the the, the public in general uh, by enumerating certain specific conditions or criteria, which will be uh, decisive when determining whether media are operating in a free and independent fashion or not. And hopefully this will help uh, also uh, pushing and, and, and promoting further discussion about the state of media freedom in those countries and, and uh, also uh, increasing the pressure on publishers and media houses, which will for the first time be forced to prove that they are indeed taking specific steps towards protecting independence of their journalists and, and that will be a process which uh, I'm really interested interested in, in, in observing and, and seeing how, how it will play out in, in various countries including Czech Republic of course uh, but many others which uh, uh, have a very uh, dubious record on, on editorial independence. Well thank you thank you very much I will now like go to the Q&A uh, part of the of the panel because we have at least four questions right now. One of them is about enforcement. So, um, so one of our like people in the in the audience says enforcement is of course key on the Media Freedom Act. So national independent regulators are not as independent from the government. Um, how can we expect that they will properly enforce the Media Freedom Act? What about interference with the press, which is traditionally an unlicensed media? Could the rules on editorial independence, et cetera, give the opportunity to some governments to intervene even there? I think that's, uh, that's something that was like part of the final remarks as well. And if I may, uh, I would like to to you to put this question next to another one that we have that is like that is about more or less the same. Um, the same topic, which is the, is the European Board for Media Services really independent? The, the last one could be like a little bit controversial, I think. Uh, 
Um, so many many questions, uh, many questions. Let's say put together. Uh, so of course, um, it's uh, it's of course uh, obvious that it's very important that uh, that those who are in charge of implementing uh, Media Freedom Act are actually independent and uh, and uh, and where I mean, of course, it's a little bit difficult uh, to invent. Um, uh, a magic uh, QA if you rely on um, on uh, national authorities uh, for uh, for the implementation. So of course, uh, as, as as we do, we we put uh, independence requirements um, in uh, in the in the act uh, in the proposal for the regulation itself. Like in Article Nine, we require that the board shall act in full independence when performing its tasks. And in the case of uh, uh, in the case of a board, uh, you could say that okay, if um, if there is uh, one authority for which we would have uh, doubts about its independence, there are still all others uh, who who will preserve, let's say, this collective independence of uh, of the board, uh, especially taking into account that you know uh, the, the what is envisaged is um, two thirds majority voting, which um, which you know. Should not be omitted as an important uh, aspect because uh, because then uh, still as a collective body uh, you can expect that uh, the board will act uh, independently and then at the national level uh, of course um, you know uh, there are again requirements in the proposed uh, regulation itself uh, and they not only point to independence but also adequate financial human technical resources uh, and so on but um, but true that uh, that we cannot exclude that um, certain national regulators might be uh, not entirely independent and uh, and then uh, what uh, the regulation does in uh, in some cases uh, it allows uh, uh, it allows, so first of all, in some cases, it foresees uh, appointment of other authorities, but okay, then you could say those other appointment authorities might also like independence. And uh, in in some cases, then, okay, there is a direct link between between the board and, um, and the national level. And for example, this uh, catch-all article on different national measures taken in the media market, it allows the commission to request that the board uh, uh, directly issues an opinion on, on such national measures, and um, and then you know this way, uh, this way, uh, if in the scenario of an, of a national authority which is not independent, it would not influence uh, the the board's opinion other than by participating participating in the board. But then again, it's one voice out of uh, twenty seven. Thank you very much. Maybe um, is, is there like somebody else who from the panel who wants to come in to this question? Just a very quick point mm -hmm. on that, if I may. Um, I'm really glad that Adjusa uh, cleared that up. Um, I think <laughs> if I can just uh, always picture the, the worst case scenarios, um, because uh, you may have one rotten apple, but what if you have more, <laughs> more than one rotten apple uh, and, and that amounts to one third of uh, those present in the board? So unfortunately, uh, I think uh, it's, it's always important to be ready for, for worst case scenarios. But one thing though that, um, that I wanted to add uh, related to the board, uh, which is another perhaps criticism, uh, is, uh, is actually something that, um, that approaches it from a different aspect, which is that most of the boards the board's decisions are not binding, obviously, they are opinions. And so I wonder how this will function in, uh, in practice and what will happen if an opinion uh, by the board is published and then uh, there's no follow-up afterwards. Um, so that's, that's one question that I had. Well, thank you very much. I think we have like 10 minutes left, so probably this is uh, better. It, it's better to come back to, to our questions we have. One coming from Johan Di Almazano that says that when assessing the media market concentration, the impact on the formation of the public opinion is one of the elements to take into account. What are the measurement tools available to measure this impact? If there is a, if there is a link with the online players that audience measurement systems, can you please elaborate on the role? Yeah. 
it's it's a difficult one. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a, it's, it's slightly <laughs> difficult. Uh, but um, look, uh, we are not at that stage yet, so um, we don't have yet uh, a list of uh, very concrete. Uh, 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 very current parameters how to measure this uh, this impact on the formation of uh, public opinion, and then uh, the the article itself on media market concentrations. So first of all, it uh, you know it leaves some space uh, for the national level uh, to set out uh, in advance uh, rules and procedures for assessment of media market concentrations. Uh, and uh, one one of the point uh, precisely asked to set out in advance objective non-discriminatory proportionate criteria for notifying, and then uh, and then uh, list some elements to be taken into account um, you know, for the assessment. But of course, uh, it's true those elements are not uh, too detailed. Well, as they they still are like uh, broad directions of travel and not uh, very detailed uh, rules. Uh, but then again, the solution that the regulation finds is uh, guidelines, and uh, and then um, the commission, assisted by the board, may issue guidelines on the factors to be taken into account when applying the criteria for assessing the impact of media market concentrations on media pluralism. So, uh, so let's say it's again the combination of uh, of uh, of. Uh, of already clearly saying uh, what uh, should be taken into account, but leaving it uh, to the guidelines uh, to, uh, for for the more detailed uh, way of assessing. Well, thank you, thank you very much. So uh, we only have five minutes, and we have one one question left. This one is probably about a, a topic that we that we haven't discussed uh, right now. Jamie Patel. Yeah, like the question is, I have a question in Article 19, if there is a space for that. So Jamie, if you're still on the call, uh, just like please um, unmute yourself and, and launch the question. Okay, so maybe you can you can write it on the chat and then I will like ask it to the panelists. Okay, great. Can you hear me now? Yes, all good. Hi. Yeah, and it's probably easy, it's easier to say um, uh, because it's, it's a little bit complicated. Uh, in Article 19, as you all know, I'm sure that there's this new right for consumers to um, to customize the interface uh, for certain media offerings um, in order to, to allow them to move away from the default settings. Um, but my question was really about how far did that uh, new right go? Because um, these days people are consuming media on devices which have many many other services included just to think of your iphone you have the netflix app you have the bbc app the iplayer app, but you also have lots of other services including banking games etc so um my question really perhaps to audrius but also to others is you know is there some thinking um from the commission about where this right would actually apply because it could interfere with um with businesses ability to present services and products in the way in which they like for their consumers um so any clarity on that i think would be very helpful in order to, to be able to make that right uh, an important one which is which it is uh, but working in the in the appropriate space when you're talking about media freedom well thank you very much um audrey i see you moving do you want to come in Yes, uh, uh, so as as with many provisions of this European Media Freedom Act, the, this article was a balancing exercise. So balancing between indeed uh, to provide some further consumer guarantees uh, for them, for managing uh, of, of, of audiovisual media services and uh, trying not to interfere too far in the operation of, of the markets. And so perhaps the emphasis should be put here on uh, audiovisual media and audiovisual media offer. So we, we did not intend, let's say, to go as far as uh, covering, you know, all possible interfaces and uh, app stores and how screens of uh, mobile phones uh, look like with all their uh, different apps. So we're thinking about environments which are really specific for 
audiovisual media services, so remote controls with a um, dedicated um, button, for example, which is only about uh, one media service provider or then the landing uh, screens of uh, connected TVs. So user interfaces which are really very close to our audiovisual media offer and to what extent uh, 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 they, you know, they already pre-configure your access uh, to audiovisual media services, or on the contrary, to what extent do you have the choice uh, yourself to configure uh, how this interface uh, looks like. And uh, uh, European Media Freedom Act say, takes this second route that indeed consumers uh, uh, shall have the right to to easily change uh, such uh, default settings. Uh, with uh, one uh, little detail that uh, again in the uh, in the interest of better regulation and managing uh, regulate, regulatory burden uh, this provision will start apply uh, a bit later than uh, than most uh, other provisions of the act so for article 192 which is the obligation on on the industry it shall apply uh, if, of course, this is retained by the court legislators. It shall apply 48 months after the entry into force of the uh, regulation. Thank you very much. We have one last question. This is the last question because we're definitely running out of time. Um, the the question is the following: We understand that the Commission's proposal received a negative opinion and then a positive one from the scrutiny board. What changes have the Commission made? I'm not sure if you can comment on last uh, on this last one, Audrey, but. but um, we have curiosity here. <laughs> yes, uh, so let me answer, you know, to the extent uh, that I can. So, uh, first of all, you know, these um, negative opinions, like uh, let's say I have some some experience of uh, different legislative initiatives. So it's not uh, that often that uh, that you go through with uh, positive uh, opinion immediately. So it's quite common to uh, to get uh, a negative opinion and to improve a uh, impact assessment. Uh, as a result, uh, and uh, in this particular case, uh, for example, we revised uh, quite a lot of the presentation of the problems so that it's uh, much clearer and, and that uh, problems and drivers are linked uh, in a much uh, clearer way and um, reinforce each other. And uh, similarly for the impacts, uh, we we were digging deeper into economic impacts. So okay, what what it, what it means in terms of uh, impact for example on revenues of uh, different media outlets on the market and uh, we constructed a model uh, demonstrating how different options uh, would result in different impacts on on the revenue so things like that <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you very much for uh, to absolutely everybody who stayed with us until the end and to our four panelists here um, just to just to say that uh, this was a wonderful discussion, and I and I hope that we could follow it up in in the future. I I agree with everything that has that has been said here in the panel. It's a very like timely uh, piece of legislation that is relevant and is ambitious, and we hope that it continues like this to till the end. So have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very thank much, you. and thank you for the discussion. Thank you very much. Bye.